Good morning. My name is Karen. The Old Testament reading is found in Isaiah 52, 13 through 15. Look, my servant will succeed. He will be exalted and lifted very high. Just as many of you were appalled by you, he too appeared disfigured and inhuman, his appearance unlike that of mortals. But he will astonish many nations. Kings will be silenced because of him, because they will see what they haven't seen before, what they haven't heard before, they will ponder. The word of the Lord. Hi, my name is Martha. The New Testament reading is found in Philippians 2, 6 through 11. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count quality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. The word of the Lord. Hi, my name is Wanda. Thank you for standing for the gospel reading found in Mark 42 through 45. And Jesus called them to him, and he said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it is not, but it is not so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave to all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to our Lord Christ. Let's remain standing as we pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the faithful and loving, humble and gentle and good God that you are. We pray now as we open up your scriptures that you would speak to us by the Holy Spirit, that you'd open up our eyes and our ears and our hearts and our minds, not just to know you, but to love you and to become like you. We pray these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, Amen. You may be seated. So good to see all of you this morning on this first Sunday of the fall. The autumnal season has begun. We are in a series this fall called Complete Joy, and it's a series through a letter in the New Testament, a letter called Philippians, and it's written by Paul, who was one of the early followers of Jesus and quite a church planter. And Paul started a church in the city called Philippi. You can read the story of it in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16. Uh, Philippi was a, a Macedonian city, but it became a Roman colony, and when Paul showed up there, there was a mix of these Greeks, but also... So Rome, retired Roman uh, soldiers, and he started this church in the home of a, a wealthy woman named Lydia, and Lydia and some others began leading this community there. And as we've been in this series, the reason we've called it Complete Joy is because it's one of Paul's happiest letters. Now, if you've read a few different letters that Paul's written that are in the, the, the Bible, that are in the New Testament, you'll know that Galatians, he's kind of mad. You know, you kind of get angrier, Paul, concerned, Pastor Paul, in Galatians. But in Philippians, Paul's pretty happy. He says rejoice a number of times. He talks about joy a lot. But we're at the point in the series now where we're, we're about to come to the center of Paul's theology, the center of Paul's life itself. You see, for Paul, joy is not a feeling or a thing that we get from the experience of life. In fact, Paul's writing this letter from prison. Joy for Paul is a person. 
named Jesus. In fact, if you were to to search on YouTube, the Bible Project Philippians, you would see the Bible Project video of Philippians. They do this really nice drawing where they show you that this passage here in Philippians 2, 6 through 11 is the center of his letter. There were no chapter and verse markings when Paul wrote it. So in a very real way, you could say this is the core of everything Paul's trying to say. And all the stuff he'll say about how then they should live and what this means for their hope and their faith and their joy, all all comes back to this center, who Jesus is. And so today, we're going to talk about the person, the pattern, and the promise of Jesus. The person, the pattern, and the promise of Jesus. Who is Jesus? If you ever stop for a moment and just think about how much has been written about Jesus over the course of several hundred years, 2,000 years. Uh, Actually, more has been written about Jesus than any other figure in human history. And what's fascinating even about the New Testament letters is we have thousands of copies of these New Testament letters compared to 20 copies or so of something like Livy's Roman History. Something that was written maybe within 100 years or so of the New Testament wasn't Our earliest copies of it don't show up to 900 years later. The New Testament, we have copies of it that show up within 100 years of of these events happening. And there were copies made and copies made and copies made. It's, It's like from the beginning, people said, we've got to write this down and we've got to send this out. Something about the person of Jesus has inspired and sparked great action all around the world. In fact, in Jesus' name missionaries, people have left their home countries, gotten on ships, sailed around the world, built hospitals, built schools, fed the hungry, cared for the sick and the poor in Jesus' name. There's no other name that has inspired that kind of life. So what is it about Jesus? The person, the pattern, and the promise of who Jesus is. Let's start here with the person of Jesus. When you look at this passage in Philippians 2, This is often called the Christ hymn. And we don't know if this is a a pre-existing song that Paul is quoting for the Philippians. Or we don't, and we don't know if Paul's actually writing the song on the spot. He could be. As a kind of a songwriter myself, I'd like to imagine that Paul shifts effortlessly from theology to poetry, you know. He's writing to the Philippians, and then he's like, who in the very form of God, you know, and just starts singing, and the scribe's like, should I be writing this down? Okay, let's write this down, you know. He bursts into song right away. At the very least, we do know that the story of Paul planting the church in Philippi uh, began because Paul was singing in a prison cell in Philippi. So singing maybe was part of this Philippian church's practice from the beginning. Either way, here's a hymn that Paul begins to talk about. And this song actually retraces key events in the Jesus story. This is a song that tells a story, kind of like country music, but better. And so if I want you just to see a few of the key movements, the key events in the life of Christ. The song begins with the incarnation. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God something to exploit. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and by becoming like human beings. And when he found himself in the form of a human, now we move to the next key event, crucifixion. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And then the third movement in the Jesus story, therefore God highly honored him and gave him a name above all names. This is resurrection. And the final movement, exaltation. So that at the name of Jesus, everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth might bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I want to say three things to us about the person of Jesus as we see it through the song. The first is this, that Jesus is truly human. Truly human. Not just that he you know, became human, that's the point we want to make. Yes, he somehow, Christian theology makes us confess that he doesn't stop being God, but, then he, but he becomes human and he is fully God and fully human. And so in that sense, he's truly human, but there's another sense in which This song invites us to reflect on the humanity of Jesus. You might say it this way. Jesus is the true human. The only true human. C.S. Lewis says, you shouldn't think of your mistakes and then say, well, I'm only human. C.S. Lewis says, actually, none of us have ever actually been truly human. 
All of us have been less than human. When God made you and me, he made us in his image to reflect his glory in the world, to to reflect his rule and his wisdom in this beautiful way. And the only person that we've seen who's lived that out is Jesus. So if you say, what does it mean to be a fully healthy, flourishing human? Christians would say, look at Jesus. And for all of you singles in the room, it's remarkable, isn't it, that Jesus is single. So there's no, here's what I mean by that. Culture might say to you, you're not fully human until you get married and have kids. And the Bible says, whatever your vision of being fully human, it is not necessarily that. You can be married and have kids, that, that's fine. But to be human is nothing to do with your marital status. Come on now. <laughs> okay. To be fully human is to look at Jesus. Now, this song, Philippians 2, quotes some or echoes some of Psalm 8. Psalm 8, the psalmist is reflecting on humans and he says, you've made them just a little lower than angels, but you've crowned them with glory and set them over all of creation. The Philippians 2 ends by saying, Jesus was crowned and exalted to this place and he rules over all. This is, the, this is Paul's way of saying Jesus did what human beings were always supposed to do, rule in the right way. Reflect God's glory in the right way. So he's truly human. And by the way, I want to say, all through this song, Paul's doing several things. This is the power of art. All of you artists in the room here, songwriters, artists, painters, art can work at several levels all at the same time. You, you, You read a good story, you watch a good movie, you're like, man, there's so many takeaways, so many layers, it's so complex. It would have taken like 10 hours to lecture on that, but like in one hour of television or in one art piece, you're like, Whoa, all of that. Well, that's kind of like this song. There's a lot going on in this. And one of the layers of this piece of art, this poetry that's going on, is it's quite a bit like a a, a genre called Jewish resistance poetry. And there actually was a genre of literature called Jewish resistance poetry. What I mean by that is there's several points in this song where Paul is, to put it in our slang, he's trolling Caesar. He's basically taking their propaganda and saying, nah, that doesn't apply to you. And here's one of the things right off the bat, even by calling Jesus sort of the one who took on, who became human, he could be riffing here on something that Octavian did. So we're going to talk a fair bit about Octavian today. You may not be fresh on your Roman history, so I'll update you just a little bit. Julius Caesar was kind of the first um, of the Caesars, and they they all took on his name to follow that. But Julius was assassinated by the senators. I I don't know if you remember this story. There was a Shakespeare play written about this, okay? Etu, Brute, anyway, all of that. So Caesar is assassinated, kind of stabbed by these senators. But when he dies, the empire splits into four, and there's four different rulers kind of vying for it. But he has an adopted son named Octavian, and Octavian wins a crucial battle in this Roman civil war in guess what city? Philippi. In Philippi, this Macedonian city that becomes a Roman colony, the site of this pivotal battle in the Roman Civil War. So Octavian wins this thing, but he's trying to act humble. In fact, the whole story of how Octavian gets more and more power is quite a bit like Senator Palpatine in Star Wars. (laughs) It's like, no, no, I couldn't possibly, okay, yes, give me those powers. And so all along the way, Octavian's having to play the, the PR game of like, oh, I'm really not that powerful. So his favorite title was the, 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 the title Princeps, which means first man. And he was like, I'm not really powerful. I'm just the first man. I'm just the first man of Rome. I'm just the first man of the known world. Now, think about this. Some 70 years, 80 years later, Paul's writing this and he's saying, the first man is that guy? He's dead now. Let me tell you who the first man is. It's Jesus. You're looking for an example of what a true human is? Behold, Jesus, not Octavian. You you see what he's doing here? Okay. Now, the next thing he does is that he says to us in the song that Jesus is truly God. Jesus is truly God. There's something that's amazing about the end of this song. He says, Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is, what's the word? Lord. Lord. What does that word Lord mean? 
Well, there's two resonances. Remember, art can do a couple of layers at the same time. One of the layers is this Roman reference, because Caesar called himself Lord, Kyrios. And Paul's saying, he's not really Lord. One day, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. But there's something else Paul's doing, and this is on the Jewish level. In the Jewish scriptures, what we call the Old Testament... The name of God, the covenant God of Israel, was too holy to pronounce. And so it was indicated by the letters yod Hey vav Hey y a w y h w h Yahweh, sometimes how we say it. But they wouldn't pronounce it. They would, every time they saw that written, they would say Adonai, which means Lord. And when the Old Testament was translated into Greek, which is what these people were reading around the time of Christ, they used that Greek word, Kyrios, for Lord. So here's what Paul's doing. Watch this. He's saying, every knee is going to, con- con- every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Adonai. Jesus is the Kyrios. Jesus is Lord. Now, if you were a Jew listening to that, you would immediately stand up and say, blasphemy. How can you say that a man is not Adonai? Adonai is the, the invisible God. There's no images made of Adonai. How can you say Jesus is Adonai? But then watch what Paul does. They'll confess that Jesus is Adonai to the glory of God the Father. Now you're like, you just gave Jesus the same glory and authority of Yahweh without diminishing Yahweh. If Paul had emojis, he would have put the mind-blown one right there. (laughs) Guaranteed. It would have been like this. This is unprecedented theology. Nobody wrote this. And Paul says, "I, I, I know. But if you look at Jesus... He is Adonai. And it actually works out to the glory of the Father. So that we don't split. This, this is the beginning of, 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 of actually the, the Christian theology of the Trinity. Which leads us now to the, very, the third thing we want to say about the person of Jesus. Jesus reveals what God is like. Now, here's the question for us when we read this hymn or when we sing this hymn, when we read this passage. It says, Jesus who did not think that being equal with God was a thing to be grasped empty himself. And the question is, was Jesus doing this in spite of the fact that he was God or because of the fact that he was God? Let me put it another way. Do you start with God is all powerful, almighty smiter, you know, like Bruce almighty God, that kind of God. And then Jesus says, Ah, I know what you think of God, but I'm going to empty myself out and die. You know, it's sort of like the kid who knows which parent to go to. You got the strict parent who always says no, and then you have the good parent, typically mom, who they'll say, Hey, can I talk to you about something? I'm wondering if I could watch a little extra TV this weekend, you know. Uh, Is that what's going on here? The Father is angry, almighty. And Jesus is like, he, Jesus is God, but he gave himself up. As a, is that what's going on? Or is it because Jesus is equal with God, he gave himself up? In other words, are the actions of Jesus contrary to who God is? Or do they actually reveal who God has always been? You catch this, guys? That's the key question. What's at stake in how we view this? What's at stake is how we view God. So many of you grew up in, in contexts where your impression of God was God's super angry, super fussy, bunch of rules. And then Jesus came and was like, shh, dad, chill out a little and I'll die instead. And so either we have some sort of weird kind of, you know, divine child abuse kind of thing, or we have a dysfunctional family situation happening within the Trinity. And Paul says, listen, Jesus does not save us from God. Jesus saves us as God. That's the difference. That's the difference. Y'all, that is a light bulb moment. That's a key revelationary insight to say, this isn't, this isn't something different. This is what God has always been like. My friend Brian Zahn says it this way. He says, God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. We have not always known this, but now we do. God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. We have not always known this, but now we do. I like that. 
I like that, and it has some implications for us about even how we think about evangelism. Many of us are familiar with the two-step approach to evangelism. You know, get an atheist to become a theist, and then get the theist to believe that the only God is Jesus. That's a fine approach. It happened to work for a lot of famous people, C.S. Lewis included. But I want to say to you that perhaps in our day and age, the goal is not to convert people from atheism to theism. The goal is not to say to an agnostic, why don't we start with the belief in God? You know why? Because the belief in God will raise all kinds of other questions. Well, why do I need a God? And why is there this? And how come there's that? And I want to say to you that actually what Paul does is he starts with Jesus. And if you start with Jesus and you say, this person who died on a Roman cross, whom God raised up on the third day, if the resurrection is real, work your way outwards from there. Don't start with your nebulous, generic view of God, whatever sort of deism or enlightenment view of some man in the sky, the the dude upstairs, the old man, whatever it is, the kind of whatever general view of God, and then say, okay, let's argue our way towards Jesus. Listen, I'm not interested in converting people to general views of God. I'm not interested in people becoming theists. I'm interested in people confessing. Jesus as the Lord of all. And Paul says, let's start with Jesus. If Jesus reveals what God is like, how does that change the game for you? How does that change your doubt for you? How does that change your questions for you? And to write the famous, the brilliant New Testament scholar and historian of early Christian uh, centuries, tells a story of being in a cab uh, with a London cabbie on his way to a theology conference and the cabbie says, hey, what are you on your way to, mate? You know, I'm going to do a terrible uh, version of this here, but it's just more fun if I try. And uh, and N.T. Wright in his proper, you know, Oxford BBC English says, well, I'm on my way to a theology conference to talk about Jesus and the resurrection. And the cabbie says, well, I don't know about all of that, but isn't it true that if Jesus rose from the dead, then the rest is rock and roll? And N.T. Wright kind of sits back in the cabin and he goes, yeah, basically. (laughs) If Jesus rose from the dead, the rest is rock and roll. Like, look, you can work your way outwards from there, but you cannot have less than Jesus, the crucified and risen Lord of all. Start there. Start there. It's amazing because if Jesus reveals what God is like, you know how different this is from the Roman view of God? Octavian As soon as he took power, people began to miss his adoptive father, Julius Caesar, and they began to commemorate Julius Caesar as divine. And they said, oh, he was God. We need to erect some monuments that show that Caesar was the first divine ruler of Rome. And you know what August, you know what Octavian did is he said, he said, sure, go ahead and build those monuments because if my dad was God, what does that make me? The son of God. And so Octavian allowed the rumors and the whispers and in in fact possibly even fed them so that it would exalt him. Jesus, who being equal with God, did not view equality with God as a thing to be grasped. You see the difference? Octavian's like trying to ratchet up something, a rumor that's not even true. Yes, more of that, more of that. Jesus is like arriving on earth in a lowly stable hanging out with the rejected and the despised, the outcasts, the marginalized. What a difference. Which God, (laughs) which God is that? It's so different than the picture we have. As the story goes on, we, we move into the pattern of Jesus, the pattern of Jesus. Now, I'm going to pause for a moment and tell you a little story. You ready? Um, In 1997, there was a uh, clinical psychology textbook called Aversive Interpersonal Behaviors, meaning stuff that you do that drives people away. And it includes a chapter about interpersonal reactions to excessive egotism. It was written by a Wake Forest professor and a handful of undergrad students, and this chapter, this paper, concluded that self-centered people who project arrogance through their speech and body language tend to be viewed less favorably by others and can actually weaken a group's cohesion. Oh, it was an interesting paper, landmark kind of chapter. It was interesting. But what was more interesting was who one of the undergraduate students was that co-wrote that chapter. 
was a young undergraduate senior by the name of Tim Duncan. NBA fans will know that Tim Duncan the very next year went on to be the number one pick in the NBA draft by the San Antonio Spurs. He was named Rookie of the Year. I, it was not my choice, by the way, to put these pictures up, but Lori Duncan, who runs our slides, is a San Antonio Spurs native, a San Antonio native and San Antonio Spurs fan, so I don't really have control over what shows up on the slides here. Lori does this. But Timmy went on to min, win multiple rings, and um, people began to try to interview him and do stories on him, and they, they always found that Duncan was just so boring. I mean, one journalist even tried to write a story and goes, there's just nothing to this guy. He's so humble and soft-spoken and all he cares about are about the fundamentals of the game and his teammates. The most animated you'll see, you remember seeing Duncan is when he's trying to talk to Tony Parker or Manu Ginobili, and all, you know, maybe telling Manu to stop flopping, I don't know. Um, but this is the era, this is the era, you know, of Kobe Bryant. <laughs> this is the... The same year that Kobe announced his retirement and did a farewell tour at every Laker game so that fans, adoring fans could applaud him, Tim Duncan went through that whole season at the very end, just dropped a little note that said, I'm done, I'm retiring. Such a different guy. Basically lived out his career like the essay, or like the academic paper that he wrote as an undergrad. It's pretty remarkable. But you know, we hear stories like that and we think, oh, it's so amazing, Your servant leadership, that's the way to be. And in fact, there are a lot of business books today. Simon Sinek's book, Leaders Eat Last. Uh, um, Even Jim Collins' Good to Great book has some stuff in there about servant leadership. We take that as a given today. Okay, that's enough of Tim Duncan. You can take him down now. (laughs) And we take this for granted, like, like, (laughs) stop it. We take this for granted, like this is the way it's supposed to be. Like, like, Like good leaders are always put themselves last and put others first. But do you know, That is not always the way people used to think about leadership. Caesar would have never written the academic paper that Tim Duncan wrote. In fact, if you could list, you could could search for all of the Greek classical values, the values that Greek philosophers taught, Plato, Aristotle, and you could say, what did they think was the, the upright and virtuous citizen? You would not find humility in that list. You wouldn't find it. It's not a classical virtue. Rome had a document called the Via Romana, which means the Roman way. And they used it to educate young Roman men to become the rulers of the world. And, 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 and in so many ways, our notions of what a good man and what a virtuous wife is, all of our notions of domestic hierarchy are all Roman. You'll find lots of those virtues there, but you know what you will not find in the Via Romana? Humility. Humility. Of all the lists of public virtues, of all the lists of private virtues, absence from them is humility. There's an ancient histor- a historian of the ancient world, a British uh, scholar named Tom Holland. He's not a Christian. And he's written a ton on this stuff. And I actually tweeted him uh, last week when I was preparing this talk. And I said, Tom, would you, would you say that humility was not a classical virtue, that it is a uniquely Christian virtue? And he said, yes. Humility is a uniquely Christian virtue. Isn't that amazing? The only reason in the West we praise a leader like Tim Duncan or can write books like Leaders Eat Last and pack out our TED Talks and all of this, the only reason we can praise that is because 2,000 years ago, a Jewish teacher was crucified on a Roman cross, but God raised him. That's the pattern of Jesus. Now here's Paul, amen. Now here's Paul writing in AD 50, something like that. And he's saying to these young Philippian believers, he's like, you don't know this yet, but I want you to live against the grain of Rome. I want you to live against the grain of Greek virtues. I want you to live against the grain of Roman virtues. I want you to live in a new kind of way. I want you to trace the pattern of Jesus's life. Live that way. It's interesting because... Again, I I think Paul is trolling Caesar in big ways. Seventy years or so before he's writing this letter to the Philippians, Octavian, in 27 BC, on a mid-January day, Octavian came before the Roman Senate, having united the empire, having quelled the civil wars, having amassed all of this power, Octavian comes before the Roman Senate, who still had the charade of 
being the ones in power. And Octavian decided to resign all of his titles. He said, I'm going to strip myself of all of these titles. I don't want anything except the title of this elected official that you've given me. Now, (laughs) you can judge for yourself whether Octavian was sincere or not, but I'll tell you what the Roman Senate did in response. They said, no, 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 no. We can't let you empty yourself of your titles. We're going to give you the highest title. And they gave him what was called the civic crown made of oak leaves. And they named him the savior of the people. Interesting, isn't it? The servant crown and the savior of the people. Now, and they named him Augustus. This is how Octavian became Augustus, which ironically means the great one. Augustus promptly hung up this crown above his door, minted on coins that he was the savior of the people. This is all some 75 years before, before Paul's writing Philippians. And you have to wonder if Paul in the back of his mind is thinking, you guys all know that story. Remember, Philippi was a Roman colony. It was a Macedonian city that Rome took over and colonized. You don't think that the Philippians were used to hearing Roman propaganda every day about Caesar? Of course they did. They were probably indoctrinated with this story of Octavian becoming Augustus. And Paul says, you know that story. You probably learned that story since you were a boy. But I want to tell you that Octavius is a liar. Augustus is not the real one. Why? Because he didn't humble himself even to the point of death. Paul says, Jesus humbled himself even to the point of death. And then he says, even to death on a cross. Jesus didn't just die for us. He died in the most humiliating way possible. Stripped naked, suffering on the cross, bleeding, gasping for breath. A scorn that a good Roman would avert their eyes. They wouldn't even speak about crucifixions at a dinner conversation. It was so hideously shameful. And Paul says, you think Augustus humbled himself? Did he die? No. Did he die on a Roman cross? No. But Jesus did. Now, some of you poets in the room, you'll appreciate this. An old art of poetry is to parallel the first line and the last line, the second line, the second to last line, and build your way like this so that the center of the poem is the key point. Do you know what the central line of this Philippians 2 passage is? The death on a cross. Every other line has parallels. You get to the center. Death on a cross. I imagine that's the moment if this was a hymn that all of a sudden, oh, the singing would stop. And they'd say, oh, Jesus, you really went that low. You didn't put on a show of your humility. You actually died. This is why N.T. Wright says, Jesus is the reality of which Caesar was a parody. Caesar is the fake version of this. Jesus is the real version of this. And the Christian life is patterned after the life of Christ. The Christian life is actually patterned after Jesus, not Caesar. And when you look closely at this picture and zoom in and reflect on the cross, that's why Christians throughout the ages have put a cross up in a place of worship so that we can reflect on it and say, this is the heart of our Savior. And when you reflect on the cross, this is what you see. The Jesus way is not about the love of power, but about the power of of love. That's the Jesus way. The world can go mad all around us, putting on fake displays of humility and servanthood so that they can gain more power. And all through the noise, Jesus calls us and he says, do you embrace the self-giving, self-emptying, sacrificial power of love? My kind of love. The final piece of this hymn is the promise of Jesus. The promise of Jesus. When you think about the promise of Jesus, we think of these final verses in the hymn, therefore God highly honored him, exalted him, gave him the name above all names, so that at the name of Jesus, everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth might bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is our promise because 
For 2,000 years, people have looked at Christians worshiping this person, Jesus. People have looked at Christians and said, you're, you're absolutely mad. How can you worship this guy? It's no different today than it was then. If anything, it was way worse then. Earlier this week, I recorded a video for a ministry called Open Doors Ministry, which helps us learn about and pray for the persecuted church. And they asked different pastors to record videos of them talking about the countries and praying for them. The country that they gave to me was the Central African Republic. About 4.7 million people, over 70% of them are Christians, and yet they are the target of extreme persecution from militant Islamic groups. And as I'm reading this dossier that they gave me of all of these facts and details, I'm, I'm reminded again that we belong to a long and large a long story and a large family of followers of Jesus who have worshipped his name at great cost to themselves. And it's good news that one day every knee will bow. One day every tongue will confess. And it's not in a gloating, told you so sort of way, but it's in a way of vindication, of saying the saints and the martyrs throughout the ages will one day be vindicated by saying, look, you weren't alone in worshiping Jesus. There's been millions and millions of others throughout there. It may have felt like it was you in your tiny little village in the middle of Africa, fleeing for your life, fearing for your life when you knelt down to pray and when you stood up to sing. But I want to say to you, stand and look around at the great family from every tribe, from every tongue, from every nation and language saying, Jesus is Lord. That's our promise. One day it's going to happen. One day it's going to happen. And I know in the West, we object to the exclusivity of Jesus. If there's one objection that skeptics have, they say, well, why does Jesus have to be the only way? Why can't there be other ways? Why does it have to be Jesus? And I want to say to you this morning, the problem is not the exclusivity of Jesus. It's the question is, is he worthy? Is he worthy of it? Let me give you a, a lay per, uh, just an example from everyday life here, okay? Anybody read reviews before you buy something? Before you choose a restaurant? Yelp, please tell me the best Thai food here. The best, you know, I need to read reviews. You're not looking to give equal time and money to the one-star reviews. You, you don't read the reviews and say, well, I appreciate going to the five-star Thai restaurant with 2,000 reviews, but shouldn't we give the one-star restaurant a shot? It does, the reviewer does say that they've had issues with salmonella, but shouldn't we just give them another chance? I just want to be loving and charitable to all restaurants. You don't do that. Exclusivity is not the problem. Quality is the question. The question is not, is it okay for Jesus to be the only name? The question is, what kind of God is he? And so Paul says, Because you now know that this is the God who did not grasp at equality with being God. This is the God who emptied himself and died for you and went to the cross for you. Because he's that God, he's exalted to the highest place. He's exalted to the highest place. This is an arbitrary. Paul wants us to say again in the hymn. There's that key word, therefore. Because he went down to the lowest, therefore God exalts him. Because he is good, because he is faithful, because he is loving, therefore he's the only name. And that's good news. People say, well, how can it be good news that there's only one name? Because there's only one worthy. Because there's only one worthy. It's not good news if I lie to you and tell you that there's 10 different options and all religions are the same. They're not worthy. Listen, Augustus gets one month of the year named after him. All of human history divides on the person of Jesus before Christ and in the year of our Lord. Nobody's gathering anywhere in the world to sing songs to Caesar. Nobody's writing hymns to see to Rome and singing, po- writing poetry to Rome. Nobody's gathering together. The, the persecuted church in China are not gathering because they want to somehow lift up the name of Octavian. But all around the world, under great threat of persecution, there are people calling on the name of Jesus. He's still the worthy one. He's still the worthy one. 
When we stand in church and we sing that he's the name above all names, when we stand here and do this, we're doing this with Christians all around the world. I love the line of the old vineyard song, Brian Dirksen's song, Come Now is the Time to Worship. This one part of the song says, One day every tongue will confess you are Lord. One day every knee will bow. But still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Would you bow your hearts this morning?